All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Welcome, panelists and audience members alike. As you take some time to settle into the webinar, I'll just say a few words of welcome on behalf of all of us behind the scenes here at Virtual Fourth Space. This is the second in our series of conversations between deans. The first episode back in July was to welcome uh, Faculty of Fine Arts Dean Annie Gérin to Concordia. And now we have the great pleasure of welcoming Faculty of Arts and Science Dean Pascal Sicot to our community. We are fortunate to welcome Pascal in such good company today as she is joined by her co-conversationalist, John Molson School of Business Dean and Marie Croteau and our moderator professor in the Department of English, Jason Camelot. Fourth Space produces all manner of activities related to university initiatives and research so as to connect our community of faculty, students, and staff to questions pertinent to us all in and outside of the university. So to that end, today's conversation is an important investigation of the landscape of academic leadership and its meaning and value today. Before introducing our moderator, a few procedural notes. This event is being recorded and will be available on our website, which is concordia.ca slash four in the coming days. And we are currently live streaming to Facebook as well. So you can check that out at CU Fourth Space. You can see it in my name, in my signature. We invite those of you attending the webinar to use the chat for any comments that you might have throughout. And if you have pertinent questions that you'd like our moderator to address, we would suggest that you use the Q&A, the button at the bottom of your screen. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Camelot, a professor and tier one Concordia University Research Chair in Literature and Sound Studies in the Department of English. An excellent candidate for this conversation on academic leadership, Jason himself has an extensive record of administrative service, having served as chair of English for four years, uh, six years as Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and as Chair of the Editorial Board of Concordia University Press, just to name a few examples. His, his administrative experience is currently being channeled into his role as Director of the Spoken Web Shirk Partnership, which is a multi-million dollar program that develops and studies AV documentation of literary history in Canada. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. I'm handing things over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for, for those of you out there, we'd be really interested to have you start adding some things to the chat and question right away. So maybe tell us where you're joining us from. Um, are you a student? Are you a faculty member, alumni? Um, just uh, give us some sense of who's out there. Um, um, so and welcome from my basement, um, uh, I'll say, uh, but also from wherever we are and from whatever we feel this virtual space is. It is a kind of fourth space for exchange. Um, I'll say also welcome from the unceded indigenous lands in and around Jajage, Montreal. Um, I wanted to say, um, you know, the Montreal, uh, a Montreal poet and spoken word artist, Tanya Evanson, recently shared her understanding of this Mohawk Nation word, Jojage, with me, explaining that it means broken or split in two, referring perhaps to how the island of Montreal splits the St. Lawrence River into two channels, uh, or how uh, the land masses that comprise Montreal and Laval are split in two by water so that they look like a fractured island. Um, in any case, we're, we're, we're here to acknowledge the splits and spaces that exist between us due to a range of forces, historical, human, epidemiological, <laughs> all kinds of reasons, uh, but also how through conversations and encounters like this, we're able to establish new pathways of connection, new bridges um, across those split spaces. So I feel very privileged to be here to moderate a conversation exploring academic leadership with two academic leaders that we have and are really lucky to have here at Concordia University. Um, I want to say at the outset as well that today's conversation is not a town hall. Um, it's really a, an opportunity to meet uh, our new Dean of uh, Arts and Science, Pascal Sicot, in the company of uh, the Dean of John Molson, uh, Anne-Marie Croteau. Um, so today's conversation is really about academic leadership. There'll be other opportunities to ask questions to Pascal about what her strategies and intentions are as Dean. Um, but today we really wanna meet her um, and talk about what it means to move into positions of leadership at universities and how and why one finds one's way into such important roles. So we're gonna be hearing personal stories from 
from Pascal and Anne-Marie directly. I'm going to introduce them only very briefly so that we can move quickly into this conversation. Um, and so I'll just say that uh, Pascal Sicotte is a Montreal native. Um, uh, she earned uh, her, uh, her degrees up to her PhD from Université de Montréal. Um, and she's an internationally recognized primatologist specializing in the behavior of mountain gorillas and colobus monkeys. Uh, she's published you know, many peer-reviewed articles uh, in high-impact journals. She's consistently held NSERC funding since 1993. Uh, she's a very experienced researcher. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're, very, uh, we're very interested in hearing about the relationship between one's research career and one's administrative career. Anne-Marie Croteau is a Dean of the John Molson School of Business, as we know. She teaches at the doctoral, master, and undergraduate levels, and her courses cover topics around strategic management of information technology, uh, fundamentals of electronic business and management information systems, and many other things. Um, and so thank you both for being here. Uh, Pascal, welcome. And Anne-Marie. And um, I guess we're going to begin. Yeah, thank you both for being here. We're going to begin with um, uh, an opening question. Um, really, the, the first question is like, why does one want to become a dean? How does one find oneself in this position? Because as we know, many of us don't go into academia to become deans or provosts or presidents or administrators in any way. We go into academia to explore research questions that we're passionate about. So maybe Pascal, as a way of introduction, you could tell us a little bit about how you got here. That is such a good question, Jason. Thank you for your introduction, by the way, and, and for your words. Uh, you boosted my profile a little bit. I'm going to have to rectify a few things, but that's okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> of course, we don't enter academia. We don't start a PhD and say, um, I will make my way to become chair of department and then dean and, and provost. In fact, I think it would probably be um, worrying to know that this is, you know, the path that one envisages right away. Um, so why, how did I end up um, here? Is I think it's a, it's a combination of um, the skills I had to develop for my research program to be able to to follow up in my research program, organize a team of grad students, uh, uh, work. I, I do my field work in Africa, and so I have over the years brought a high number of grad students in the field, but also undergrad students in the context of a field school. And so working under these conditions is always uh, you always have to plan for contingencies. You always to imagine what are the desired outcomes when you put a program together and you have you, you have a, a, a clear path as to where that will lead you in terms of your research, for instance, in terms of the output necessary for you to, you know, be able to reapply for the for the for, for a grant. That planning, that logistical side of things, that ability to relate to people to put them in a situation where they can achieve their best. Um, are, I think, all components of what makes a good academic leader. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Uh, I, I think I'd like to ask Anne-Marie a similar question, um, because I think it applies to all of us that w as we move into, into these roles. Anne-Marie, how did you find yourself moving into administrative positions or positions of leadership at uh, oh. Yes, it's one step at a time. Uh, the actual first one I, I got is was as the program director for the graduate certificate in e-business. And it's in the early 2000. And it was a program that we were eager to launch and to, to have at the John Molson School of Business. And I was working on the curriculum. I was proposing the courses, collecting information, curriculum ideas from our various uh, faculty members. And then at one point, Gregory Kirsten, who just passed away a few weeks ago, told me, you're the director now. Well, I'm just, I just want you to go on and become the director of this program. Uh, he worked very closely with me and he was saying, that's, that's a good occasion. I was not even tenure at the time. And I was so involved. I'm believing in it, it so much. I said, what does it mean? What, 
what is it? So I actually had to, to hire an assistant uh, and all this. So we put this all together. We got it accepted. And I launched a program with Gregory. And uh, it, it lasted a few years. And then everything related to e-business started to, to become part of the regular curriculum. So the program doesn't exist anymore. But it was my very first step. And it's because I've been asked. I've been pushed. And uh, later on, I just moved on and took on other responsibilities as the program director for the executive MBA program and then as associate dean and so on. So it starts with one who tells you, why don't you look at this? And it's a good test. You may like it and you may not like it. I happen to like it. <laughs> and we're glad that you did. Uh, <laughs> <You'll see. laughs> but I think you raise a really interesting and important point is that uh, we find our way into different roles through interactions with our colleagues, um, with mentors, right? Uh, and, uh, and that we find ourselves increasingly in mentorship positions as we move forward. So Pascal, I'll sort of turn back to you and ask you um, maybe if you have a story similar to that about someone who was important to you that sort of, sort of showed you to yourself that you could do this, but also how you've moved into understanding your role as a mentor for, for others uh, around you. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. You know, when I think back, I think that, uh, first of all, I have to say, uh, some of my most important mentors uh, have been men. Uh, they, my, my, my PhD um, supervisor, for instance, uh, was a very important uh, shaping element in, in my life. But when I think recently about, you know, the, the people who really have believed in me um, for things that I was not yet thinking that I was ready, uh, was was my 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 dean at Calgary. Um, I was a department uh, head. We call them head at Calgary, and uh, I was I knew I was doing a, a good job. It was a challenging uh, situation, and I was doing a good job. And at one point, he um, called me in his office, and it was it was getting to be like in my fourth year. And so we, I thought, okay, perhaps he's going to ask me, uh, would you like to renew, you know, your, your headship term? And, and I was going to tell him that I might consider it, but I would have to think about it. And anyway, um, in the conversation, he said, um, what, what, what would you think about becoming vice dean? And the vice dean in Calgary is a uh, Le vice doyen, c'est pas la même chose qu'un vice dean. Là. Associate deans have vertical portfolios, but vice deans have horizontal portfolios. So when you think about it in terms of the deputy provost in relation to the provost, the vice dean is to the dean what the deputy provost is to the provost. And it was completely, completely a surprise to me. And I thought, what? Me? Never. You know, I'm not ready. Um, and then, of course, it flattered me that he would think I was able to do it. And I said, okay, I'm going to need a bit of time to think about it. And then I decided to take um, things into my own, my own hands. And I think it was a test for me to see if I was able to perform in that role. And which was that without telling him, I asked for a meeting with him where I actually interviewed him. And I asked him, what is it you expect of me? What are the outcomes you would like to see? Where do you think the challenges are? etc. I had a list of questions. To me, that was a way of taking control of the situation and not only to be carried, you know, in, in the role, in the situation. And not only was I happy with his answers, <laughs> mais je me suis aussi senti à l'aise dans euh, ma relation avec lui à ce moment-là. Alors, quand tu parles d'interaction, que c'est à travers les interactions qu'on se sent euh, prêt, à ce moment-là, j'ai senti que j'étais prête. Thanks. Um, I think that uh, it's really interesting because the story you just told is is a bit of a story of self discovery as well. You, as you took took control of the situation, you became proactive. You learned something about yourself in relation to that situation. So I wonder if we can continue this thread for a, a bit, and uh, I'll turn to Anne Marie, and then and then back to you, Pascal. If there are are real moments that tested you, right, uh, along the way, where you learned something about yourself, and it was just reinforced. Not only so you move from the position of saying like me, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not ready, to like, oh yeah, I, I am ready for this, and, and I learned uh, this about myself, so I know I can do this well. 
Uh, Anne Marie, are there moments like that 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 uh, sort of you can think back on where you were tested and you realized, yes, this this is for me, you know? Okay, I, I may just start by saying something similar happened um, when I've. Uh, I was asked to serve as the interim executive MBA program director. At that time, it was like uh, the director at the time was going on sabbatical and it was a six month uh, interim position. And uh, as you may know, the EMBA is uh, a program that is offered on Fridays and Saturdays. And it means for the director to be there on campus. At that time, that was the model. And at that time, I, my son was only four years old. And I said, hmm, not ready to, to spend my Saturdays on campus when he's so young and all that. So I went to the dean and uh, I had a conversation with him, Dean, dean um, Sharma at that time. And he said, and the phone, <laughs> the cellulars were starting at that time. So that gives you a, we're ba what? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, listen, I'd rather have a young woman who starts early with academic leadership now, like you, that a woman that wait for too long before she can actually have access to a position when she thinks that she's ready and everything is all put in place, the family is taken care of and so on. So he gave me his support by saying, don't worry about the Saturdays, be there other days, which I did and be on, uh, on demand when needed and come on campus when needed. And it was a good deal. The students were very supportive. Same with the staff, Sharon Nelson, if you're there, thank you. Um, and it was, a, I would say an exercise that stayed with me because now when it's time for me to recruit department chairs, program directors, women and men with young kids, that's the line I take with them, which is, listen, uh, start now. Take some experience. Don't wait for everything to be all set. You know, start earlier than too late. Uh, so that's one lesson, and it's sort of a mentorship at that time that I received from him, which is go for it. So I'm not fully under, uh, answering your question, maybe, but it's something uh, because I heard the, the start of, and I said to myself, that's something important I want to share, which is start early rather than wait that everything's in order to, to take on a, a position. I think it's a great answer. Pascal? To me, uh, Jason, I think that as I was beginning in my leadership roles, particularly as a head, um, I, so I, you know, I think that we all often have uh, doubts. And Marie, I think you'll agree that we never think we're ready. This is exactly what you were talking about earlier. Um, but then as a head, when I realized that I actually was able to um, carry out difficult conversations with people that were coming to me with issues, problems, um, to realize I was able to hear what they had to say, that I was able to deconstruct the problem, that I was able to offer guidance. And then at the end, when people would say, oh, you know what, this has been such a helpful conversation. Then, you know, when that happens once, you say, okay, and then time after time you realize it doesn't happen that often you know that people are able to find a place in a space where they can be um they can be heard they can present their issues they can um search for solutions in in, in a productive way not in a necessary i mean i don't like antagonism i i and it's not that i will avoid being in conflict with people although i say that perhaps i will but I, I am able to engage in conflictual, conflictual situations, but it's not my preferred mode of operation. I much, I much prefer approach a situation by, you know, calming down. And I have to tell you um, that physically, it's, I, I also, I'm a primatologist and I say that often. I, I, I observe primates for a living. And so I know uh, the, the, um, the body language is very, very important. We all know that, but I pay particular attention to body language when I'm in a situation that can be potentially confrontational. Um, I, I'm, I, I've said that in a, in a few, on a few occasions, but you know, when I'm with somebody who's very, very angry, uh, I always make a point in person to sit in a chair where I'm going to be a bit lower than them because it gives them an advantage. They feel they have the advantage 
but I'm controlling the situation. Um, if, on the other hand, I don't want them to feel that they have the advantage, I take a chair where I'm sitting a little bit higher. Anyway, these may seem like trivial details, but they're actually quite important in setting the stage for to be able to carry out the conversation the way the way that hopefully will be ideal for you as a listener and I, as a setter of the tone, I would say. Um, and and hopefully to get to an outcome where people feel comfortable and happy. Merci, Pascal. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is, a, I'd like to continue with this thread for a moment. Uh, we, we talked earlier and we, were, we, we decided we're going to avoid making jokes about how your experience as a primatologist and working with monkeys and gorillas prepares you to be a faculty dean. But I want to ask a serious question about this. And maybe you could paint a picture for us a little bit, because you spent a lot of time in Rwanda uh, working you know, in proximity to, uh, to primates, right? Um, maybe bring us a little bit into that experience of observing what, you know, a little bit more than what you've even just said, um, observing behavior um, and how uh, the skills that you hone to li in listening and watching in, in also feeling what you, you yourself are, ex are experiencing as this is happening, how some of that does find its way, you know, in, 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 as the examples you began to provide in your interactions with your colleagues in administrative settings. You're, you, know, you, were, you were a chair of the Department of Anthropology before coming here to the Department of Bi Biology. So, you know, as an anthropologist, we're all, <laughs> we're, all this, we're all engaged in different cultural formations and you're, you know, so there's a real con continuity, I think, between your primatology and, and other tasks. But can you give us a scene of what it, what it feels like to be in the field like that and then how that maybe informs your, your interactions with people in all scenarios? Absolutely, because I think it both shaped me, but it also is part of who I am. Um, so um, as an anthropologist, you know, anthropologists, when they go in the field, they do what is called participant observation. They try to immerse, that's the traditional approach. They try to immerse themselves in a cultural context. They try to understand the interactions, the, 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 the what's happening in the political system, etc., of the people um, that they're with. As a primatologist, I cannot do that. Of course, I don't do participant observation, but I do do direct observation. I When I was with the gorillas, you know, the... the the important point was with the, when you were with the group to be at a place where you were close enough to be able to see the interactions between individuals. And that could mean something as subtle as a glance um, or as a little, you know, sound like this to say, go away from me, um, without disturbing the individuals by your presence. And so there's, after the a group is habituated to human presence, which can take months or years, depending on the, on the species and on the habitat, when they're habituated, there's, there's, there's this, this point, which is often a moving point, where you know you're not disturbing by your presence, and they allow you to be there, and they know you're there. You cannot be hidden, because if you're hidden, then... If they suddenly discover you, they'll be surprised and you don't want to create a bad reaction. You want them to know that you're there and to be patient with you. I'm not saying that they're accepting your presence, but they're patient with you. Certainly for the gorillas, that was the case. And, um, you know, through these, I mean, I, I'm having goosebumps when I, when I describe this because uh, this is such a wonderful feeling to know that you're close to this group and you're observing their very intimate moment, uh, a mother with her infant who's just born, um, you know, an infant who's learning how to crawl, um, and, and, uh, and you, you share these moments with them, and you share them because you know these individuals individually, you know these gorillas, for instance, in that case, individually, you know who was their mother, who is their sister. You know uh, what they've gone through. Have they transferred from their natal group? Are they in a new group? Um, are they having issues trying to integrate themselves in this new group? Um, and so you, 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 you put all these interactions that you see on the moment in the context of what you know of the history of this individual and the social interaction, the social relationship that this individual has with the other members of his or her group. So... Um, this is perhaps too, more than you wanted to know, <laughs> but uh, 
that that uh, skill set or 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 that side of my personality. I think it's you know it's a kind of a um, there's a feedback loop there. Um, of course, it's giving me um, tools. Although at the beginning I think it was unconscious, but now I'm using them as I said tools to uh, be able to observe what's happening in the group, to assess, um, I think, relatively rapidly, um, situations. I think I have good judgment about situations, and partly that may be because of that. So I don't know. Am, am I a primatologist because I had that in, you know, at the beginning or not? Am I, <laughs> Jason, am I answering your question? You are, I think, and what I find really interesting, and I'm going to I'm going to turn this into a question for both you and Anne Marie now, uh, and it's based on a comment that one of uh, with, that someone in the audience has shared with us, and it's based on uh, your affective presence, sort of how you are. Like, uh, just a comment. I love Pascal's calm and caring presence. It really shows through here, right? But being calm. Uh, isn't always easy, right? And especially, uh, well, you know, I, I think being calm in the field that you were just describing us, I, you know, I could, I was getting stressed just imagining being that close <laughs> to, you know, to the gorillas. Um, but also being a dean, right, is not, um, it's usually not a calming uh, form of work, right? It's a very stressful form of work where many things are coming at you quickly. Um, and so, but both of you, you and Anne-Marie, and I should, and this will be another question we can turn to after, but we're at a really special moment uh, in leadership at Concordia with so many um, uh, women deans right now. Um, um, and so we'll turn to that after, but it's a question about how you manage to stay calm, um, to stay caring, sympathetic to those around you, despite all the stresses that, you, that, that are thrown at you, you know. Uh, how do you cope with this? How do you relax? You know, and um, and what what skills have you developed in order to do that? In order to stay calm leaders, which I think even just your presence makes other people feel more comfortable. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll turn back to you, Pascal, and then ask Anne Marie to think about that question as well. And this this is an interesting question because this is um, something people often tell me that I have a calm. Uh, presence and, and my voice, uh, I think, partly uh, participates to this. Um, I, I'm going to be frank again, and I know this is being recorded, but very often uh, I'm terrified inside. So the projection of calmness <laughs> doesn't always <laughs> reflect my internal state. Um, this being said, I am much, much better at... I don't want to say that what I project is a false sense of calm. This is not the case. Um, I can. I have learned over the years how to snap out of these times of panic that I sometimes feel, like everybody, when we face a difficult situation. Um, I've I've learned to take enough distance to uh, to be able to reflect in a calm fashion, basically, and and this very process I think allows people around me to do the same. Um, I I hope I'm not. Uh, you know what I would like to say is that I will never engage. Uh, with people in a panic or in anger. I, or at least it's my hope and it's my desire that I never do. If I come to a point where I feel I am unable to engage because of a sense of fear or a sense of panic, I stop, I do not engage, I retreat, I reflect, I regroup, and then I go. Anne-Marie? It's so interesting what you say. I'm personally a very introvert person, it's bizarre to say, because you may expect that uh, we're in the public phase, we meet with everyone, we have to speak to everyone, but if you would see me in my uh, personal social uh, gatherings, uh, I'm the last one to speak. I'm always, I'm, I'm actually a very good listener. And I think when it comes to that type of leadership that we need in uh, academia, it helps to be a good listener to be someone who receives what the others have to say, because when people ask for a meeting with the dean, they have something to tell you. They want to speak to you. So they want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want to be valued. And I, I'm good at it. I think I'm a natural uh, I'm natural at saying thank you to people. I'm, uh, I love seeing people, hearing their stories. So it's very natural for me. 
and it helps. When it comes to the stress management, um, I had a few tests taken regarding your leadership style and I score very uh, high on the capacity of coping with stress. Uh, it's the way I'm built, I guess, and uh, I guess, so it helps, definitely. And I'm like uh, Pascal, I don't want to engage when I'm upset with things. When I'm upset, I will say it to people, but very, very special reserve group of people who I can trust and they know who they are. Um, because at the end, as leaders, we still have to be the face of our university, our faculty, uh, our emotions belong to us. Uh, as individual, if I had an upsetting meeting prior to this current meeting, it shouldn't show. It uh, I, I pay um, I take uh, I make an effort to always like be uh, upbeat at the right level with the new person that I'm meeting, so they don't feel like what happened is it me and so on, and they start having this this new scenario of uh, what was wrong with our meeting when it has nothing to do with that specific meeting. So I would say being calm is definitely um, a thread, a trait que je partage. Que... And you know, it's also um, my, my trick when it comes to this is what is it that I can control and what is it that cannot be controlled by myself? What, it, what belongs to me? And then I reflect on it and I take over and I, um, I'm working on it. But there are things that are simply not under my control. I may need to watch, I may need to monitor, so I'm you know, aware of what's going on. But it's my way of um, detaching myself from the situations where it creates too much stress and maybe because it's not under my my control. So that's the, the thing I try to do, which is um, what is it that really, really belongs to me and who else can help if it's not with me? So that's one way. Wow, we're learning a lot of really useful strategies here, I think. Uh, so thank you for sharing these. There are a few really relevant comments for a couple of threads that I, I'd like to continue with. Uh, so the first thread is about being in, introverted or being an introvert in a very public oriented role, right? And what kind of powers, maybe even superpowers, <laughs> we could say come from um, that, that personality inclination, right? So, so what, are, what are the benefits of being an introvert and pushing yourself to some extent out of your comfort zone um, uh, in having to play this role? And the other is, is a question, I think it may be related, but you can decide. Um, we have a question or a point that this discussion of the importance of calm in a leadership role is very thought provoking. Uh, and the, the question arises if there is a dimension of being calm to counter sort of gendered assumptions that women are emotional or, you know, that, that is there a gendered element to um, yeah, the, the performance uh, or demonstrating sort of the, the kind of the way you handle uh, difficult situations, things that are out of control. So, so one is just sort of about introversion and the other is about sort of the more gendered nature of, uh, of leadership, I guess. You know. uh, maybe Pascal, is, si, si tu commences. So a component of the question, the first question was uh, we're being pushed out of our, our comfort zone. Uh, th th that very question, the last question is pushing me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> it's a good one. I think that I have to answer yes, there is a gender component in the qualities that we put around a female leader being calm. Um, and having a voice that is perhaps on the lower tone as opposed to the higher tone. I know that as a woman academic, um, I have worked, you know, to avoid uh, developing this higher pitched at the end of a sentence that many of us have a tendency to adopt uh, very often. And it's, it's uh, that little you know, I, I don't know if everybody knows what I'm talking about, but if I was to finish a sentence in a way that goes like this, it um, induces doubt. I induce doubt myself onto what I just said. So, and this is a, an advice that I've given to all my female graduate students. When they prepare for a talk, 
whenever they go like this at the end, I say, no, you go like this at the end. Because it closes down what you say. It closes down your sentence, closes down your thought, and I think you're less vulnerable in that sense. So yes, there's a gendered component. Uh, the first question was the, 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 the relation between being introverted and being out of uh, one's comfort zone. Totally. I am out of my comfort zone. I mean, I am less now. I think perhaps my comfort zone has expanded now over the years. But if I look back 25 years ago, even five years ago, if you had told me, even two years ago, if you had told me you will be dean one day of a large faculty in one of Montreal's universities, I would have said, are you dreaming? No. But um, I think that I will come back to what Anne-Marie Bartley has said, is that you need people to ask you, you need people to force you to think about what you could do and, and to make you realize that perhaps you are ready. But coming back to the uh, introvert aspect of it, I'm struggling a little bit here, but I, I, I think that because I don't get, you know, I, I need to regroup, I need to retreat in, or, in order to replenish my energy and my, and my ability to cope with difficult situations. I am not feeding off these situations. If I was feeding off these situations, my sense, and Anne-Marie, you correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I think I would always be on the lookout for a difficult situation, for a fight I can pick up, for um, um, a, a fire on which I can blow. I don't feed off these situations. In fact, I want them to, you know, calm down. Um, so perhaps the, the fact of being an introvert allows me, by the very fact that I don't feed off these situations, to perhaps be more comfortable moving away from them and dealing with them in a different way. And Marie, qu'est-ce que tu en penses? I think when it comes to uh, the type of leadership that fits well with the academic milieu is um, a, a leadership that is very much of a, a bottom-up approach to be um, close to what our faculty members think, need, and so on. Same for the staff members, the students, and to become their voice, to become the, the, the one who facilitate things to help them accomplish their uh, full potential. I, that's, how, that's how I see my mission. That's how I see my role. Um, so that bottom-up approach has something that is very um, très bienveillant. Uh, there is a caring that comes with it. It's maybe very feminine when it comes to it, but it's it's very natural to me. But I think it's also um, very particular to the academic world. You cannot walk into a faculty member and tell him or her, this is what I want you to do. Or same with staff. It's like, this is what you do. And uh, I cannot put on the, the dean's hat and expect that people will just obey. Ça marche pas comme ça. Put on your academic. Uh, See, everybody's running its own small business when you think of it. They have their own research grants. They are intelligent people, capable, autonomous, and so on. Our role is really to facilitate everything. So there's a lot of caring around our role when it comes to becoming a dean. Um, I, I, I believe that's maybe what makes it feminine because the caring approach, which is, okay, who needs what? It's very maternel. C'est comme ça qu'on est comme maman. On est toujours en train de, de se préoccuper de nos enfants, nos, nos, nos conjoints, nos, 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 nos membres de famille. So there's a bit of similarity, similarities there, but I think there's a special perfect fit for that type of leadership in academia. Je pense que c'est surtout ça le, le message qui fait que it's not a gender thing as much as the style of leadership that we need in academia. Merci Anne-Marie. Uh, did should... I do the, 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 the pitch up or I'm good? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, oui, c'est plus, plutôt un, un style uh, réflectif et pas réactif, peut-être. Tout à fait. Ouais. Euh, on n'est pas là pour allumer des feux. 
Uh, au contraire, and to, 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 to pick those fights for, no, uh, we have no time for this. We, we, there is no benefit to it also. Yeah. So um, prompted by another question that's come in, and it's something that I was thinking about um, earlier, um, a lot of these kinds of encounters that we've been describing are in-person encounters, you know, um, but we're obviously living right now in a virtual environment. Um, and um, so one question that was asked, uh, it noted Pascal's mentioning early on that she adjusts the height of her chair, right, um, when having a potentially confrontational conversation. But how do we adjust ourselves when prepping for difficult communications, uh, encounters, interactions in this new virtual environment? What does it mean to be a dean online right now? And how do you keep connected with, um, you know, with, with your constituents, with, with everyone? You know? Uh, Pascal? Well, first of all, I, I, it's difficult. And we have to acknowledge that it is difficult. Um, and uh, and I've, I've started my term under these conditions. Um, and so I, I have met very, very few of, of my team members in person. Um, I can count them on almost a single hand. Um, I... We all know that, but I find Zoom meetings exhausting. Um, and partly is, I, I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to think, okay, what makes them exhausting? And and I think that I'm always, I would say almost uh, hypervigilant to try to um, hear all the, the various, you know, modulation and the tone of the voice, to, to look at the facial expression, to try to understand what people are trying to say, not only what people are saying, um, and so that that come that has a toll. I think that that's no uh, no surprise to anyone. We we all feel it, but I'm working hard to try to understand where it comes from. And sometimes I try to disconnect from this very high intensity um, focus that I need to maintain all the time because I'm, I'm I can I cannot continue. I think. Uh, you know, eight hours a day like this all the time. Now, this being said, it is important um, to find ways by which people can really truly feel connected to you. I find that when I have a meeting with only one screen, it's it's relatively easy. I see everybody at the same time. I ask a question, they nod, or they say no, or they have a thumb up, and that's, oh. that's good. Um, it's when we have meetings with more than one screen, Oh my goodness, I, I find that really, really difficult. Um, I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning. And what I'm doing, honestly, is I have two of, of um, my team members um, uh, monitoring, you know, the other, the other uh, screens at the same time and, and they report back to me and, and so that's useful. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, you know, we find ways to try to create informal contact on Zoom, which I think is actually very hard. Everything feels more formal. Uh, we don't have, uh, if I can just say, as a new dean, what I miss the most um, are all these informal moments when, for instance, you walk between meetings with someone and you can debrief, or, or just by being with somebody in their office, you learn stuff by osmosis, you know, because they tell you stuff that they wouldn't have said otherwise. Um, and, and this we miss completely, you know, by Zoom, it's not happening. Yeah, it's much harder to check in, have those little calibrations, you know, that, uh, that allow things to run smoothly. And Marie, you have to move from the transition, right? Yes. Already being a dean. Uh, exactly. And uh, my, my uh, running joke right now is that I miss the elevators in the MB building. <laughs> We're waiting for them for so long. Uh, Pascal, when you'll come and visit the MB, you'll realize that they're badly designed. We have lineups at crush hours and rush hours and so on. But during that time, this is where you can catch up with people. You can have this little chat. You take the elevators with them and then even if it's a few seconds, you still see if they're doing well, you connect with them. So it's all this informal uh, chat that, 
that you're talking about that is missing and I'm missing that. So right now I'm doing the ma tournée and uh, actually that's how I start. I say, I cannot see you in the elevators anymore. So here I am in the Zoom meeting, just trying to see if uh, I can see you smiling. Are you good? Hot thumbs up and so on. Just to catch up to hear what you're saying. But you're right. When it comes to doing those virtual informal coffee meeting and so on, it's difficult to have the sense of um, of uh, légèreté parce que c'est comme who speaks when you don't want to interrupt your mic on off it's not it's not easy but you know that's what it is now at least we're safe and all this and um, Pascal chapeau to you parce que onboarding yourself like you do online like you are doing chapeau it's amazing it's uh i admire you for this because it's certainly not easy it's not easy but you know what jason i want to say we we i say we because annie Gérin uh, from uh, fine arts is in the same boat as i am we started on the same um at the same time and uh, we're both uh, onboarding uh, like this but um i have to say we feel supported there's a wonderful um team of deans and marie is one of them murad Gina Cody is, is also a, a wonderful colleague and um, and and everybody in the provost um, office I have to say is just um, amazing in providing the support and they're so patient I I email them all the time Nadia Hardy in particular whenever in doubt my motto is whenever in doubt email Nadia and uh, I you feel got supported. it right and you know what I feel supported and I'm I'm very 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 grateful Thanks. And there is a, a very supportive group uh, in the upper administration at the university right now. Um, coming back to a question, I mean, we started talking about it and there's quite a lot of interest in it. I see in some of the questions being asked. Um, we, we have, I guess, uh, we have four faculty deans and a dean of School of Grad Studies at Concordia. So five deans. And right now, four of the five are women. Um, we have um, um, a provost who's a woman. We have um, uh, VPRGS is a woman. Um, so there, there are questions that are popping up, like, do you, you know, do you believe that women are more likely to think they're not ready than men when deciding to undertake leadership positions? Right now, we're at a moment where we have um, really an amazing number of talented women in leadership positions. Um, so as a new dean entering this place, say, compared to Calgary, I'm not saying that they don't have a lot of women in leadership roles there uh, also, um, or also Anne-Marie, you know, sort of being one of the one of the more recent uh, first deans who now being joined by many women. Um, are there things you would comment on in terms of what this means for Concordia and what it means for your potential as leaders um, at this moment? It's interesting what you say, because um, at the John Wilson School of Business, we've applied to get the certification for parity last year in 2019, and we got it. And we were certified gold by the governance, um, women in governance. So we're the first business school to get it, the first academic institution beside um, Polytechnic. And I was thinking about it this morning, especially thinking about our, our uh, panel now. I said, wow, Concordia should apply now, given what's going on at the top. Uh, our board is led by a woman now. There's a lot of good things happening, and I hope personally that the fact that we are engaged, that we are several women, female dean, uh, provost, and so on, that will inspire other faculty members to join and to say it's doable. Um, they don't have to be perfectly prepared. I think what matters is that they feel well supported and that the adjustments are made so they, they can keep up with their research, career, family. Family is always something that's, you know, stopping them or keeping them before joining. I, I'd like to share something that I've been told when I was associate dean. I attended one of those seminars when they talked to associate deans about what is it to be a leader, et cetera. And there was this woman dean who said that she has been dean since her kids were very young, five, six years old, I don't remember, but very young. And she was saying that her kids saw her in such role all their lives. So they were used to see her being busy, being a dean and so on. So they learn early on 
that's what Maman fait. It's, that's what uh, is happening. This is their reality. So the guilt part was not there for her that much. And the counterpart of this also was that because she wanted to be a good mom too, she did all the activities or shared a lot with her husband. That's a, a very important key there. Uh, but they were giving her a sense of balance also because the kids are, you know, I still have to take care of my son's homeworks and oversee that. And it's, uh, it doesn't go away. But when you do this, you become a better person, a rounded person. It needs some management time. It needs uh, a good systems around you too. And sometimes you end up doing more than maybe your share, but that's what it is. All this to say is that, um, I think uh, there's room, and Concordia has been extremely good at welcoming uh, female leaders. I was the first female dean, that's true, but I never felt that it was making uh, people like, hmm, it's because you're a woman. I, I didn't have that. I was the only woman at the table for a long time, and now it's like uh, I have more women joining me, so that's good. Pascal, did you want to add anything? or? Uh... Well, I first would like to say, you know, I, coming from Calgary, I, I, I had uh, amazing uh, female leaders. Uh, Drew Marshall was the provost and Elizabeth Cannon was the president during the time I was a uh, head. And so, and these women were uh, drivers. I mean, they were remarkable. Um, this being said, at other levels of leadership, that wasn't necessarily the case. So I, I do see uh, the situation at Concordia as being a bit groundbreaking, actually. I think we're um, in the midst of an experiment, which has been planned by a few people, and I uh, look forward to see how it's going to go. I think that by the very fact that we have lived experiences that are different than perhaps other types of leaders, males in particular, um, we bring to the table a different set of issues. And I think, Anne-Marie, you were very right when you said, you know, the, the, the life-work balance, for instance, is one area where uh, we have a lot to say, you know. Um, as a young faculty member, uh, if I hadn't had an understanding department head who would literally put my teaching at times where it was workable for me to be able to deal with any crises that would arise in the morning before I took my daughter to daycare, uh, that, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. If I had uh, had a time slot at eight in the morning to teach, I, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, I'm a single mom. Uh, my daughter needed to go to daycare. I needed to be able to have the space to do my mom job before I did my professor job. So, uh, but thanks to the fact that I had supportive people around me uh, who made that possible. And I, I want to be able to continue to do that. I want to be able to do that for my colleagues. I want to do that for the people in my faculty. Uh, this is true for faculty members. This is true for staff. And this is true for students as well, particularly in the situation. I mean, not only in the situation where we're now, but particularly in this situation where we know that working from home is so, so difficult uh, and that women carry a load which is disproportionate. Um, it, it doing, doing stuff in the house and caring for the kids. And that has an impact on their performance. So we need to be aware of this. But I think that it's also, I, I want to be careful here, but I think that it's important to say also that this lived experience that we have of uh, facing so many challenges, I think, um, hopefully means that we can really be allies in the larger conversation of bringing more people from equity-seeking groups to the table and, and work with them to find ways of making this institution uh, a place where they feel comfortable, making them feel that it's their institution as well as it is ours. Um, and so it's an important part of, um, I think, the conversation as well. Thanks. Uh, continuing on this topic, basically work-life balance. Um, there's a question from another um, administrator at the university that relates to this. And I just want to say you're both, in addition to being you know, deans, um, also very active researchers. Um, I would encourage um, those in the audience to 
um, find uh, the website Explore Concordia, which basically has research profiles of all the faculty at Concordia. And you can look up Pascal Sicot and Anne-Marie Croteau, and you'll, you'll see that there are research questions there. Pascal uh, has just uploaded some of her questions, and one of them is, how can we explain variability in primate social systems, right? Um, Anne-Marie has a question, how can IT strategy be aligned with business strategy? So these are questions that would need unpacking, and we only have five minutes left, so we're not going to have time to, to unpack these questions. But, but a related question is, how do you stay connected to your research, uh, to graduate supervision, right? So in addition to having, you know, your faculty members that are, are to some extent dependent on you, your children, family members, you have your students, right, as well. Um, uh, so how do you stay connected to this work in a demanding administrative role? Um, so that's for both of you. So. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that um, I work very closely with my grad students. Uh, when we can do field work now, it's my grad students who actually do the field work. I, um, I used to go in the field and spend time with them, but now I, I can't. Um, in the last several years, I haven't been able to do that. I miss it, but I realize it's a price I have to pay. So my grad students and I work um, very closely, but I also have to say that most of my graduate students, particularly those who have graduated at the PhD level, I maintain uh, collaborations with them. Um, they're now in a, a range of institutions, some in Canada, some in the States, some elsewhere in Europe, but I maintain these collaborations and it's very, uh, it's a way for me to, to uh, not only keep a hand in the work, but to be energized, you know, because we, we regularly, uh, connect and we discuss and we meet. It's not easy. I, I will tell you, I, I have a, a 90 minute block of time every two weeks in my schedule where I'm meeting with my research team and I have to work very hard not to get this, um, um, you know, taken away or rongé par l'extérieur uh, par d'autres meetings. Um, I, I miss a more regular and direct contact uh, with field work and with the grad students because this is the part of my job as a faculty member which I enjoyed the most. I, um, but that's that's okay. I do my best. That's I think that's the gist of the answer. I do my best. <laughs> it's a good answer when you think of it. That's. Uh... I think also when we started, the, I'll speak for myself, I was the, the primary writer, the first author, you know, running the, the, the articles, the research, and with the time, my co-authors, uh, at some point when I took on more administrative role, there was an agreement that I led so many good projects that it was their time to start leading these. So it was sort of an exchange of bon service. Like I, I told them when I started as associate dean mainly, I cannot be the first anymore. You you have to to uh, lead those and I'll tell me what I'll do, I'll do it. So that part is taken care of. And it was a good uh, support system because I managed to, to keep publishing with them. Uh, when it comes to supervision, I'm so with Pascal, when it comes to the joy of supervising and spending time talking about research problems, uh, it's not as easy or um, a cause du temps. Il manque toujours de temps. I, I meet with my one of my students every week, half an hour. It's very quick. It's like, okay, where are you up now? It's tac, tac, tac. And she knows and she's prepared and it works super well. She's very autonomous. So it helps. But all this to say is that it's why we're here at the end is to do research, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm with Pascal. It's something that has to, to let go a bit, if not a lot actually, because at the end it's our Zoom meetings that are taking all our time and it's the administration, which I adore. So it's, um, je passe d'un de, de métier que j'aimais beaucoup comme chercheur à un métier d'administrateur que j'aime tout autant. Alors, I'm happy d'un environnement uh, sportif et uh, Anna just told me that um, our president is in the house also uh, here to support you guys so uh, so that it's sort of just reinforcing that we have a lot of really um, great questions that would demand a lot more time than we have because we're, we're in our last minute now uh, I'll just mention you know questions about you know what's the role of a dean in in addressing sort of 
really uh, issues that have had heightened attention this year, like um, anti-Black racism and things like that. We, don't, we won't have time, but I think this is be an opportunity for another session. I think these are some really good questions to, um, to look forward to um, discussing and talking about uh, with seriousness and with the right amount of time to do that. Um, as we're in our last minute, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Pascal Sicot and Marie Croteau for this really um, not only informative, but, um, but moving um, discussion. I think uh, uh, it was really generous of you to, uh, to, be, to give so much of yourselves uh, in this conversation. Um, and it was um, an honor to, uh, to be part of it. So thank you so much. Merci, Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pascal. Merci, Anne-Marie. Ça m'a fait Merci, plaisir. Merci, ça a été un plaisir. Merci d'avoir euh, organisé aussi. Oui. Um, if I may, I'll just uh, I step in with a few last words. Uh, I did just put a, a SurveyMonkey link into the chat for those of you who have joined us today. It'll literally take 30 seconds of your time. If you wouldn't mind giving us and our panelists some feedback, it would be very much appreciated. And on behalf of all of us behind the scenes here at Forspace, thank you to our panelists, our audience members, a heartfelt thank you to Jason Camelot for providing shape to this conversation. We really appreciated your uh, insights, your time, your energy, navigating us through what, what became a very frank conversation. Pascal and Marie, wow, uh, what generous reflections. Thank you for your thoughtful exchange. We really appreciate your time as well, and we appreciate you. And once again, welcome, Pascal. Uh, bienvenue. Uh, on, on, on espère que... Tu vas te sentir super bien <laughs> chez nous à Concordia. Um, on l'a déjà vu aujourd'hui, même avec uh, le feedback qu'on a reçu dans le chat. Alors, uh, on a une communauté hyper supportive. A quick reminder that a recording of today's presentations, conversations uh, will be available on our website, which is concordia.ca slash four. And do follow up with us on social media at cu 4 space to see what we have cooking up next. Probably more interesting conversation, conversations such as this one. So again, thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Be well. Merci, au revoir. Bye. Merci. Au revoir. I'll leave. Do you want to keep us? No, on quit. Bye. Merci Pascal. Merci Jason. C'était génial. Douglas, Anna, thank you so much. Merci Anne-Marie. Ça a été vraiment oh, très Vraiment, là, on est chanceux. On est chanceux de t'avoir, Pascal. On est chanceux d'être ensemble. Ah oui, ah oh, oui, oh, oui. OK, à la prochaine. Bye. À la prochaine. Bye.